No, you should. Okay, well, we're just start off. Sean, listen, uh, on behalf of uh, Snooker Billers Ireland, uh, I'd like to introduce the chairman, Dylan Rees, and myself, Derek Kiley, and our, our coach, PJ, as you, as you know well. And uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for doing this with us. Um, it's a first for us because uh, we've got, you know, over the years, we've kind of had up and down, in and out links with professional players. And we, we're firm believers that there's closer links to be made between the professional game and the amateur game, uh, because obviously one leads to the other. And I suppose one doesn't forget where they came from either. So it's nice for you to come and uh, join us this evening. Um, we're delighted to have you and we're delighted and, and thankful to Robbie for twisting your arm to do this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we heard that you had a fantastic uh, evening with your own club in Stevens Green. And that went down a bomb, and we're hoping that the lads will enjoy your company here this evening. So, on behalf of SBI, we're delighted to have you with us. And uh, anybody that wants to come in with a question, I'm sure you don't mind, Sean, what the question is. And uh, we'll get the ball rolling. Um, first question, I suppose, is your knowledge of the amateur game in Ireland must have increased over the last five months. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you know, I think it was always, you know, pretty strong. There's been some fantastic players come through over the years, um, you know, from, from the Republic and, um, you know, with strong family ties to the country, obviously with the name Murphy. Um, it, it's been great to be more of a part of it. And over the last, you know, three years since I lived in the country to get a feel for it, Robbie and I have been, you know, friends for a long time, probably the best part of 25 years at this stage. Um, you know, I think we locked horns a few times as junior players and there was always that um, friendly banter between us when we, you know, played internationally and stuff. So through Robbie and our friendship and knowing PJ as I do and becoming very good friends with Fergal and, and Ken and, you know, travelling the country a little bit. It's good. I think, I, I actually think the state of Irish amateur snooker is very, very strong. And Sean Murphy. Uh, I there, and, and I think there have been some great players, you know, coming through. And I think there are some, you know, I think we've seen with Aaron Hill there coming through the last the last year. Um, you know, he's really flying the flag um, for the country. Um, and of course, Ross Bullman is coming up, you know, fast on his tails. Um, I actually thought Ross might have got a bit of a nod might have got a nod there for the World Championships invite, but but didn't. And, um, you know, I was a little bit disappointed with that. But I, I think, you know, the, I think the state of the game is very, very strong here. Um, you know, when you move countries and, you know, I've been used to the UK, obviously, all my life. Um, when I came here, I wasn't 100% sure how popular snooker was still. Obviously, you know, it, it was in, in yesteryear. But, you know, you only have to walk a few paces around Stevens Green, as I do most lunchtimes, and... You know, somebody somebody comes up to you and talks about a recent match or something like that to, to, to really realise that snooker's alive and well here on this island. And, um, you know, it's it's for, you know down to you guys who have been the stalwarts of the game over here for many years. Uh, you guys deserve a lot of praise for that because, you know, as, as, as participation for the game has probably dwindled a little bit over the years around the world. Obviously, viewing figures and things like that are through the roof, as we know. But actual participation levels are probably up here, whereas they're down in a lot of areas. So I think your guys are to be thanked and to be praised yourselves for the for the good work you've done up to this point. When we're sitting here, and I'm going to let the lads in now, and I'm going to shut up very quickly because uh, I, I don't want to hug anything. But when you, we're sitting here this evening, we have European champions at amateur level. We have the likes of Josh Ballou, Aaron Hill, the man in picture there, Mark Shute, uh, double European champion, team and individual. At Masters, um, Robbie alongside you with Mick Judge, of course, team European Hello. champions as well. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the treadmill of players coming through to the European level has always been very, very strong. The one worry for me is that the lack of young players taking up the game now is a bit of a problem. It's not so much in all the areas, but in some areas. So I suppose it's going to be harder and harder. Will you take China out of the exception, you take China out of the picture? How, how do we get the younger lads back playing the game? Yeah, I think I think that's more of a, 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 a um, probably a, a World Snooker Tour or a WPBSA um, question, really. I mean, you know, we're all, you know, you've got to obviously try your best on this island. But, you know, I think I think that's down to World Snooker and WPBSA to, to make the game as attractive as possible to a younger generation. Um, you know, you guys can only do the best you can do uh, with what they give you to work with. They are the world governing body it's up to them to promote snooker as well as they have in places like china through the cbsa they have done an immense job out there making the game as popular as they can 
and it's time they do that over here and continental Europe as well. Um, you know, I know for, for the last few years, you know, I know that they've invested in the Africas and South America and, you know, even North America now somewhere that snooker has never really been that popular. You know, snooker is starting to grow through streaming rights, Facebook, um, other streaming companies, um, the, the, the participation levels and interest in snooker and cue sports is starting to grow in places that we never thought it would. Yeah, little old island here, next, you know, next door, um, perhaps sometimes yeah. has been overlooked. And um, you know, it's certainly it's something that I'm passionate about now as a resident here, um, reconnecting with my own roots and my own family roots. Um, that I'd love to see, you know, Irish snooker uh, back where it should be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure yet what the future holds in that regard, but I'd love to think that I can have a, you know, a positive impact on that um, and be as involved as, pos you know, as much as I possibly can in, you know, bringing on that next generation and the generation behind them. Um, be great to see snooker represented in a more mainstream way. But of course, that mainstream media has changed, certainly even since I took up a cue. I keep thinking that was only a few years ago. Of course, that was 30 years ago when I started playing that. Where have those 30 years gone, Robbie? Where have they gone? You're getting old, mate. I don't know. But, um, you know, the world has changed. And I think it's important that, you know, in NGBs, world governing bodies, they have to change with it. The way that the, the, way that the younger generation consume their media uh, has changed. Um, they're not in on a Friday night watching RTE. They're not watching Graham Norton. You know, they're not watching the Jonathan Ross show that I grew up watching in the UK. They're on, you know, Twitter and Instagram and, and TikTok. And, you know, we really need to catch up with them because that's the way the world's going. So we need to try and make the game, this wonderful game that we're all so madly in love with. Um, we need to make that more appealing to them uh, because somewhere out there, will be a young boy or a young girl already on this island, already already alive. There'll be there'll be somebody out there who doesn't know. But they, they may well have an innate talent to play this game. And it's up to us to, you know, it's up to us to spread the gospel of Q Sports and uh, make it as appealing as possible. OK, I'm going to shut up now and ask people uh, to come in and get involved. If you could just say who you are and to let Sean know who you are and... Who's going to be first? One second. Oh, yeah, sorry. Stick, stick your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would help. Because yeah. I've, I've muted everyone. So if you want to stick your hand up, um, we can bring you straight in. No hands. No hands. Oh, PJ. PJ. There's always one from him. PJ. Hi, Sean. Hi, PJ. There, there's many, many juniors on tonight, Sean, and the... But I would like you to like give them a bit of motivation to to say when when you were a junior coming through and you're playing, and you were one of the top juniors in England for at very young age. What what did you do on the table and off the table to help develop Sean Murphy into being the world champion later down the years? Yeah, um, it's a really good question, and it, and it, and it's a question that cuts through a lot of small talk and gets right to the, the nucleus of the problem. And, and that's, you know, obviously life was very different 30 years ago when I took up the game, there was no social media and ways of connecting with friends and stuff was, you know, you actually had to go knock on someone's door. Nowadays, it's so easy to connect with people and that's great, but it also brings with it a lot more distractions and uh, opportunities to do other things. You know, when I took up snooker, that was all I had. And I think that, you know, you, you come around to really, you know, once you, once, you, once you find, you know, an interest in the game, I completely dedicated my whole life to chasing the dream of being a world champion, being a professional snooker player. Everything I did from waking up every morning from being nine years of age, eight years of age, nine years of age, along with obviously massive help from my family, was, was geared towards ending that specific day a better snooker player than I'd started it. And, you know, my father was an incredibly tough man uh, and some of his methods were questionable to say the least. 
but whenever I was, I was going to go out with some friends or go and do, do basically go and do anything else other than practicing snooker. He would always be there as the sort of angel or devil on my shoulder, depending on what mood I was in. He would always be there to say, well, you know, do you think that's what Stephen Hendry's doing right now? And obviously as a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old boy, didn't really know what he meant. Um, but he was right, ultimately. You know, the best in the world at that moment, they were practising. They were trying to get better. And I was a 12, 13-year-old boy chasing that dream, but I wanted to go out with my mates. And uh, unfortunately, snooker isn't one of those sports where you get to do both. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a very solo sport. It's a sport you have to really chase... And those hours on your own, you have to enjoy. And if, if, it's a, if it's a bind to go practicing and working on your game and trying to improve, then it can be like pushing water uphill, PJ, as I'm sure you know with students you'll have had and that you've probably got now, you know, people with um, lots of ability and potential to be really good players. Sometimes, you know, they don't necessarily have the desire to improve. And I think that that, uh, that, that that willingness to learn and work hard at something usually outweighs somebody's natural talent at something. Um, and I guess that's, that's ultimately it. You know, the, the word dedication is, is probably the one that encapsulates the whole thing. Um, I think with most people who've made it in sport or business or any example you'd like to give, they normally have that word dedication in common. You know, they, they, they dedicated their life, their finances, everything about them was about becoming better at what they were doing. They were almost obsessive about it. But that's what made them the world leaders that they are. And um, it's very hard to have one without the other. Now, you know, of course, as a child, you know, I didn't really have to make that decision. As I say, the world was a different place when I was a kid, when you, Robbie was a kid, you know, the world was a completely different place. There were no mobile phones. There was no Twitter, no Instagram, nobody. We weren't videoing ourselves doing a TikTok dance. We were down the club practicing games and playing. We're playing for a few quid and money we didn't have. And you were learning the harsh realities of winning and losing. And But I wouldn't have had it any other way, looking back. It really was the, the, the making of myself, if I can say that. You know, Robbie's one of the most decorated players the country's ever produced here. Lads that I grew up with in the UK who've gone on to make, you know, great professional careers of their own. They all had that thing in common, which was dedication. And maybe as kids, they might have needed a, they might have needed a push in the right direction, but they still went there. And, you know, you can see those lads now, you know, Stephen Maguire, um, Dave Gilbert, Mark Selby, Ryan Day, these are the lads, you know, we were playing against them as children, as 11, 12, 13 year olds, completely dedicated their life to chasing the dream of being snooker professionals. And it's not a coincidence that they now are. Um, so, yeah, to sum up in one word, dedication. Perfect. And you also played billiards at the start, didn't you? You also played billiards. Yeah. Yeah. I, billiards was a very big part of my upbringing and the, the club that I grew up playing in um, although my family are from Kilcock in Kildare originally and then my, my parents were born in Manchester I actually grew up in the Midlands of England uh, in Northamptonshire and the club that I grew up playing at was called Rawns Q Sports and it was owned by Mark Wildman who was as well as being a Eurosport Sky Sports ITV commentator um, sometimes goes unnoticed that he was also the 1984 World Billiards champion. Um, and so billiards played a very, very large part in my upbringing in Q sports. You know, we, he would, we would spend days playing billiards. He had the most beautiful billiard room in his house. Um, and I was very lucky to spend many, many hours in there. Just listen, just watching the way he, caressed the balls around the table and his knowledge of angles was just and and over a period you couldn't help but learn from watching you know you couldn't help it um and we used to play games but but you know we played games and 
and just just trying to understand how he manipulated the, the cue ball around the table and got that cannon off six cushions and he knew it was perfect the moment he hit it and learning the roadmap of the table really was was fascinating you know I look back on those days very fondly um and of course you never appreciate them when you're young do you you know they say youth is wasted on the young you don't really appreciate those days um they were fabulous days and of course as a child you're like a sponge you're just taking in information all the time um without really knowing it um and of course there were lots of things he said and advised that i completely ignored um <laughs> obviously i thought i knew best um and it turned out i was completely wrong uh and, and uh you know we had lots of laughs we had lots of good times uh, he was actually he he was actually instrumental in getting me my first TV appearance. Funnily enough, uh, as an eleven-year-old child, I played a one-frame challenge match against Ronnie O'Sullivan when he was oh. seventeen or eighteen as reigning UK champion. He was actually playing down in the Brentwood Centre in what was the old Matchroom League, and he was commentating that weekend. And he sweet-talked Barry Hearn into letting this little blonde-haired kid um, come down to Essex and have a game with Ronnie in front of a packed house uh, live on the cameras and let's see how we, let's say, let's see how I got on. And it was very funny because I was wearing my, my granddad, Tom, as I say, who was from Kilcock. Um, I was wearing his old bow tie. Like we didn't, you know, we had nothing when I was a kid. We had absolutely nothing. And I'm wearing my grandfather's old bow tie which bloody came off halfway through the game. It snapped halfway through the match. And Barry Hearn was on the commentary box. And there's a very famous line. And he said, oh, Sean's only 11, but he's read the rules because it does say you have to wear a bow tie, but it doesn't say it has to be around your neck. Wow. And uh, my mum and dad were devastated <laughs> when they watched it. But it was a great experience to play out in front of the crowd. And yeah, I was only 11 and it was only an exhibition. But I remember O'Sullivan only beat me on the pink ball. So I took him right to the end and he was trying to win, you know, that he didn't want to lose to me in front of his home crowd. And uh, I suppose that was probably the start of our rivalry uh, many, many moons ago. But um, Mark, Mark was instrumental in those early days. But the, going back to your question, the, 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 the knowledge that playing billiards to a, you know, semi-decent level, my best billiards break is 256, um, you know, kind of understanding where the balls go and how they move um, was instrumental and something that if I were coaching young players, if I were in their corner, I would insist that yeah. they played and learned to play billiards because it's, it's probably one of those things now where, you know, you look at a lot of players coming through um, and, you know, I'll mention the Chinese influx of players. Obviously there's two or three very famous academies there in the UK full of Chinese players. They don't play billiards. They probably don't know how to play billiards. Oh, yeah. And um, in my opinion, they're poorer for it. And you you actually had a hundred break at ten years old in billiards, so that was yeah. That was, and that and was the thing the over. thing about playing with somebody like Mark, you know, there's a lot of very good billiards players in this country as well. So you know, there's there's lots of places to go for the knowledge. But the thing about Mark was he wouldn't allow me to play too many snooker shots in billiards. You know, if I potted his cue ball, he'd just go nuts and leave. Uh, you know, if I just kept potting the red, he would just, he just, you know, we wouldn't be allowed to play. So I had to play proper billiard shots. It was, you know, long hazards, long in-offs, long jennies, short jennies, lots of nursery cannons, and then working the balls up to the top of the table play, postman's knock and things like that, trying to get the balls in the right position, as he would say. And he'd come out with all of these sayings about Walter Lindrum this and Fred Davis that. And I'd think, Jesus, what's he talking about? But he was right. You know, he was right. Everything he said was right. Uh, and I suppose even by, by luck more than judgment, a lot of it went in. Yeah. And oh, um, I'm very thankful for that education. Brilliant. Like I said, there's a lot of billiard players on this tonight. So I'm just hoping the juniors understand that billiards is a fantastic sport. Brendan Devon's always telling me it's a fantastic sport and having both makes you a better player. And and coming from you now, hopefully it'll motivate the juniors. So that's me finished, lads. Go on. Go on to the next on, question. PJ. Gosh. Sorry. <laughs> Alan, I believe Alan's got a question for us. 
Uh, hi, hi lads, hi, it's Sean, I'm Alan Spain. I, I play with uh, Glen Alban uh, Snooker Club in Dublin, in the Dublin Leagues, and I'm uh, really just a snooker fan. But uh, I'm a former uh, golf caddy. And, um, Very good. I, uh, I used to read about Bernard Langer, you know, and he was saying that one time he missed a putt to win the Ryder Cup. And then the, the week after that, he won the next tournament, you know. Mm. But my question would be like, how do you handle disappointment, you know, when you've had something, uh, you've lost a match in a, a bad way or something? How do you handle disappointment? Like, question. Yeah, I think, I think it depends. A lot of that depends on how quickly the next match is going to be. You know, in a, a lot of our events in the last few years, you know, the calendar has, has become a lot more, a lot busier. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, historically, years ago, there would be, you know, a period of dwelling on disappointment, you might, you know, disappear off the off the radar for a few days, um, you know, console yourself at home or whatever. But na- nowadays, the way Barry Hearn has the tour set up, you don't really have time for it. Right. Um, and you've got to become a lot better at dusting yourself off after a defeat, dealing with disappointment, you know, in a, in a, in a much better way. Um, certainly the way this season's been with us all playing all the snooker there in Milton Keynes. You know, you can lose a match one day, 24 hours later, you're playing another game. And I suppose it's, you know, it's a skill to try and drop that disappointment, let it wash over you and just move on. And it's much easier said than done, I can assure you. And I, I, I'm still, you know, 38 year old now, father of two, um, should be fairly experienced, but I wouldn't be one of the game's best losers, I have to say. And I've been known to, you know, smash the odd hotel room up in my time, um, which I wouldn't endorse to any young players on here tonight. I'm not saying that's the way forward, but you know, I'm barred from a few hotels. I'll just put it that way. And, um, you know, I think, you know, but I think, I think of in, in all seriousness, I think when you, you know, it has to hurt you. It has, to, you know, losing has to hurt. Um, but you have to, you have to understand that, you know, the really, the really the goal is to become a better player at the end of each day or each week than you were the week before. And you will take on defeats. You are going to miss balls. Um, you will lose matches. Nobody's perfect. Um, and uh, you have to, you know, you have to roll with the punches. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Alan. And Angus McInally, who's in, who's in, is going to ask a question, I think. Yes, on mute. Hi, Angus. How are you doing, Sean? Um, Good evening, sir. How are you? Uh, a couple of things. I completely agree, first of all, with regard to billiards. As a billiard player since 1971, um, when I won the Irish Championships unopposed, nobody else entered that year. So I am <laughs> the under 16 Irish Billers champion. They all count. They all count. They they all are. count. <laughs> but um, I, I agree completely that my knowledge of snooker for both laying snookers and escaping from snookers, snookers has been unbelievably helped by billiards. And I strongly advocate anybody just to get a knowledge of that. Type. Just with regard to where snooker is, and as you know, I'm a very keen watcher and observer of having done sort of commentary for many years and now as, a, as a, an observer. I think one of the problems that may creep in is that the standard has become so high now. If you think back to Cliff Thorburn's 147 at the Crucible, it's such a, a rare occurrence, centuries, clearances. And now it seems to me that the standard is so high that it's invariably for people, a bit the way Billiards has gone, where when Billiards has played brilliantly, as I'm lucky enough to both watch and see people making 500 breaks and nothing appears to happen because it's such a strong standard. In snooker, you're having one frame visit, one, one visit frames monotonously regular, brilliant skill for anybody who appreciates it. But I feel that in terms of an audience watching who may not be fully versed, they go, that looks fairly straightforward, simple. One person, I mean, you get, without getting into Mark, Mark Williams now doing his trickle into the back of the pack, but I think it's going to be difficult to keep the interest um, if it's standard continues that there are just thousands and thousands of people playing and if there are hundreds and hundreds. So how, how do you get the balance right between the difference between the elite and the next rung? Well, I, I think um, I think it's something that the governing body are all looking at, you know, certainly in terms of the Mark Williams break-off and the, the negative commercial activity that has on the game. Yeah. Um, they're already looking at that. I can, I can tell you that as an insight. Uh, they've already emailed all the players. Uh, and we've all taken part in a questionnaire to see what we think about it because there's no way, there's no, there's no, there's no doubt that um, commercially it's negative to the game. Nobody wants to see that. Um, 
But I think snooker could do a few things to sort of make itself a little bit more appealing. I'd like to see a few more shorter format matches, tournaments, you know, against the clock, um, a slightly diluted version of the shootout. I think the shootout's a bit silly, but, mm. you know, something along the sort of 2020 route that cricket went down because in a, by complete mistake, by allowing, by making cricket more watchable and more exciting, that has, that has brought more viewers and lovers to cricket who then become lovers of the long standard traditional test match. And of course, that's all we really want to do with snooker, the absolute traditional game of snooker. We saw it last week in the Tour Champs. You know, they had a million plus viewers on one of the matches for the semi finals on ITV4, which is the niche channel. That's ITV's sporting channel. A million plus on a Saturday night is massive. Incredible. So there's plenty of people out there who want to watch the snooker in its traditional format, best of 19, the top eight players in the world. There's still a big audience for that. But I think they could, I think they could accidentally on purpose attract a, 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 a newer, different crowd to the game um, with different formats, different ideas, different innovations. I hear power snooker, that thing we're not allowed to talk about. Uh, power snooker is potentially making a return uh, at some stage with a, a, an event to see whether that can be better received than it was last time. That was, I think, that was too different um, yeah. when that came out. But you know, a slightly revised version of it might have might have space. I, I, I you know, I completely understand and was part of discussions which led to the UK Championships becoming best of 11s from best of 17s. I didn't agree with it. Uh, I preferred the UK champs the way it was. Um, but when the BBC, who are still snooker's biggest paymaster, when they say they want to have every match finished on every day, uh, they don't want any two session matches. They want every session to have a finish. They get to choose. And having yeah. had a year, having had a life in broadcasting yourself, you'll, you'll understand how powerful these people are. They get to say, they get to choose. The BBC are still snooker's biggest check writers so they still get to choose stuff like that um i think you're right i think you know billiards walter lindrum would roll in and he'd play for three days he wouldn't miss a shot <laughs> and, it, and he you know became so good he accidentally killed the game because uh, nobody everyone thought everyone mistakenly thought geez that looks see that that's not difficult mm. but i think um all these people only need to tune into any of my recent games uh, to know that snooker isn't that easy. Uh, I could miss anything at any time. Um, and I think, I, think, I think you just have to get people in. I think you have to get people in the clubs. When, when, when normality breaks out, we have to get people back in these clubs, get the clubs back open, get people playing the game. Because I think once people have had a cue in their hand and tried the sport for themselves, be it snooker or billiards, or any of the Q sports, really. Once they've tried their hand at it, they right. realise the game is the, the game isn't as easy as they think. Yeah, I mean, I aesthetically love the quality and the purity of what you do and what the top pros do, and it, an entire clearance is magnificent. But equally, I get very excited when I look at, say, Ronnie's clearance uh, when he was nine three, nine six down to Barry Hawkins. Yeah, and yeah, that clearance was those last four or five reds was absolutely brilliant. And I think that we need more of those kinds of frames as well to get the tension, to get the excitement, or else obviously the big comebacks from, you know, 9-2 down and somebody wins 10-9 or whatever. But I just think if it's uh, A breaks off, leaves one red out, B clears the table next frame, I think people will begin to feel, is, is, is this an easy game? We know it's not. We know it's not. Yeah. But I just, I just think it needs more of, just again, from the theatrical and, and tension point of view, those comebacks, those clearances when, you know, somebody missing match ball uh, or frame ball and somebody else mops up, you know, a 70 answer by a 74 is incredible. Well, I know, I know they're already looking at changing the, potentially changing the cloths, changing the balls, making the game more difficult. Um, you know, when you get a brand new number 10 strong cloth on with a brand new set of 1G balls, the game is easy. The, the balls move around the table are much easier. It's easier to spin the balls. The, the balls go in down the cushions much easier. Um, the pockets are all the same size, but they appear and they perform bigger because everything's brand new and they've got this oil and a sheen on, which makes the, the balls slip in off the jaws. So I know that they're looking at potentially... Changing the cloth brand. 
I know they're looking at maybe changing the balls or only using a one set of balls per tournament. So it's so they're not as new. Um, maybe only using one cloth for an event. So it gradually gets more difficult the closer to the line you get. Um, you know, it's a bit like the golf, you know, they have more generous pins on Thursdays and Fridays, but when it gets, comes to Sunday, they put all the pins in the nasty spots near the waters and the traps. So I know World Snooker are looking at these types of things. I'm no longer involved on, you know, at board level in those decisions or representing the players, but I know it's something they are considering. Thank you for your time, sir. And you are a magnificent player for, to watch, to play and to be around. Thank you. Thank you, I guess. Thank we you. have a question from Joe Shannon, I believe. Just unmute you, Joe. Bear with me. Hello. Hello, Joe. So, hi. Hi. Um, uh, this is Joe's dad. Joe's uh, 10 year old and he's uh, practicing snooker every day. He's mad into it. And Brilliant. he was just wondering, uh, Sean, if you would have any tips on break building for him. Um, hi, Joe. How are you? Good, yeah. What's your highest break? Um, well, in practice, I got a 147. What? Wow. <laughs> anyway, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> A one four seven, yeah. yeah do, doing reds and blacks, you know. He was doing the reds and doesn't blacks sound like you need colors. much help from me, Joe. Doesn't <laughs> now sound like you need much help now. I when I was, what did you say? You were ten years of age. Yeah. What's your highest break in a frame against somebody else? Well, it. I think it's late fifties. I think or something. Okay. So I think I think. Um, you're already well on the way. Um, you know, you're further ahead than Mark Selby was when he was your age. You know, people like that. He was nowhere near the player you are today when he was 10 years of age. Um, so remember that. I think you just, sounds to me like you're on a very good path. Whatever you're doing, I would suggest that you keep doing it. Um, maybe maybe um, there might be some little nerves start coming into things when you're playing against somebody else uh, yeah. and you might get to 50 or 40 or 50 and start to feel a little bit nervous. But once you get through that, we have a saying in England that, you know, they come along like London buses. When, when you, when you get your first hundred break, you'll have lots more. And it took me, I was, I was um, two weeks past my 10th birthday when I had my first hundred break in a frame against somebody um, and then once I had one, I had lots. But I think yeah. I, I think my highest break to that point was fifty-three. Yeah. It's funny, funny how you can remember these things. This is a long time ago. But uh, I, my poor old dad, I made one hundred and twenty-seven against him. Um, and a local queue maker had promised to make me a queue when I made my first live hundred break, and. Um, it was only a few weeks later. I was ringing him up and telling him the bad news. He had to make me a cue free of charge, <laughs> <laughs> which I've still got. So uh, that was that was great. But yeah, it sounds like I think there's lots of good stuff out there on YouTube. Um, there's lots of good footage. There's lots of good coaching things to watch. And um, there's lots of great coaches out there to go to for advice. Um, it sounds like you're already potting the balls. It's good. You've got to keep making it fun. You've got to enjoy it. Um, and if you've made a one four seven in practice, then you're well on the way, my friend. Um, but it is all about that cue ball. Yeah, Stephen, he's right. When Stephen Hendry commentates and he's in the studios, you know, try and listen to those players because they really know what they're talking about. It's all about putting that cue ball in the right position for the next shot. Once you learn how to pop the ball and it sounds like you're all, already there. It's just about putting that cue ball in the right place to make that next shot as easy as you possibly can but geez if you're if you're all make already making one four seven breaks um it could be me coming to you for help soon <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much Thank Sean. You. good luck well done okay sean uh dylan you got something yeah, to ask yeah. can, I, can i ask you sean um look we all we, we, there's a lot of players obviously on the forum here today but how seriously do you take 
the equipment, so the cues and stuff like that. How um, how much emphasis should we place on tip tips and uh, and the cue, for argument's sake? Well, I, I, I I'm I'm constantly amazed at how little snooker players, billiards players, whatever, how how little they understand about cues and tips and what it does to the cue ball. Um, bearing in mind that's what the whole game's about. And, um, you know, as, as the only thing that contacts the cue ball at all, the tip is vitally important. What brand of tip, how hard it is, what size it is, and understanding what it and the cue how that manipulates the cue ball on its way to hitting the object ball. That's the whole game. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, if you're like me, I, I play 95, probably more percent of my shots with side spin. Understanding the, the, the path the cue ball takes on its way to the object ball, cue ball deflection, as my coach would refer to it, with side spin. The tip and the cue are vitally important to that that equation um so just just picking a cue up at random is something we've all done but it doesn't make much sense and i think you know snooker is probably where golf was 40 or 50 years ago in terms of technology um, i know that i know that there are people out there in snooker now looking at different makes of you know different materials to use in cues different tips, chalkless tips. We've already got uh, fiberglass and titanium ferrules in use to reduce cue ball deflection. Um, so that there's a, it's a bit like Pandora's box. Yeah. We, all, we, we all kind of know about it, but you know, to, 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 to advance to the next level, you, you, you have to open Pandora's box. And it's a bit of a minefield, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I play with a 17 and a half ounce cue, 57 and a half inches long, a nine millimeter tip. And if I change one of those variables, well, I could miss anything. So it is vitally important, no matter how good your technique is or your mental side of the game, shot selection, all of those things. You start, you change one of those elements or get one of those elements wrong. Geez, the game becomes very, very difficult then. Um, I, I was a real um, liker of those. They came out a couple of years ago, the Sentry Tips yeah. from Sheffield. I was a real, um, I, I thought they were really, really good um, because they come in grades one to five. And when you find out which grade you like, you only ever use that grade. And they are always the same. You don't have to play them in. You're never concerned about it. If a tip comes off in a match, you could stick a new one on and carry on. That was their USP. They're a fantastic product to come to the market. Um, I ended up going back to an Elk Master tip just because I preferred the the sound that an Elk Master tip, that more traditional sound, is what I've grown up playing with. So the sound it made when I, you know, struck the cue ball was more familiar to my ear. But the but the sentry tips, being able to just pick one out of the box, stick one on, and off you go. I mean, that's very tough to beat. Um, and I, but I think that type of you know uh, usability is where the game's going. We're catching up with golf and tennis. You know, you see Roger Federer; he breaks a string halfway through the match. He goes to his bag, he pulls a new racket out, and cracks on. Mm. Um, the golfer, you know, hits one out of bounds. He snaps his club over his knee, and he he's in the tour van after the round. He picks a new drive. It's exactly the same. And so snooker is going that way. We are a few years behind. But we are going that way. And um, I think, you know, in the next few years, I think you're going to see more innovation around cues and that tech uh, as we try to, you know, as I say, catch up with other sports. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks for that. Just a question for you, Sean. I was speaking, speaking to one or two players, one player I'm very friendly with, um, and it's Aaron Hill. Um, he's found it quite difficult this year with the lockdown, the restrictions, and being in Milton Keynes. He was looking forward to going to China and to all these different countries. And no, that's not possible. But mm. has it been slightly, has it been as bad as the players have been saying? Has it been extremely difficult being stuck in a hotel location for that length of time? Has it been a bit unfair on players from other countries that had to stay in that area? Very much so. Yeah, very much so. I think, you know, I must precursor this by saying that all the lads on the tour 
you know, are very aware that, you know, in this in this pandemic scenario that we're all going through, all the guys on the tour are very, very aware that, you know, we're very lucky to still have careers. We're, we're very thankful for these opportunities that World Snooker have given us. Um, and so we don't want to be seen to be biting the hand that feeds. But it has been very hard. Um you know, for somebody like myself as a bit of a showman, you know, my wife, my wife describes me as the biggest show off she's ever met. She's right. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, apparently I just use snook, snook as my outlet. Um, so for somebody like me, who's used to that big auditoriums of people, you know, the crowd element and all of that stuff, playing behind closed doors in a single, in a single table room with me, the referee and two cameramen there has been quite hard going back to the same corridor, the same hotel room, you know, no room service, no breakfast, something gets delivered to your room in a brown paper bag. You know, it, it, it's been quite difficult, all of those things. Um, but of course, we're all very aware. This is my, very much a first world problem. There are much bigger problems going out there. But I do feel and have felt for people like Aaron, um, you know, all season because... This is their first year on the tour. This is their dream. He's dreamed of being a professional all his life. He's got to the tour and he's faced with Milton Keynes. Now, Milton Keynes has never been somewhere anyone oh. wanted to go. <laughs> uh, I, I, I grew up in a place 20 minutes from Milton Keynes and you've avoided Milton Keynes like the plague 30 years ago. So, you know, there's no way in the world any of us wanted to go there at all. But they did service a need. We were able to have the whole tour there you know, locked in one place. There was a hotel on site. Everyone was able to go about their business. Um, and really, they, they, brought, they brought a lot of positives to the game. The place itself wasn't that great. But I really felt for the players like Aaron, who, you know, at the end of the day, have tried their whole life to get to the tour. And when they got there, they were faced with this. As I felt the same for... All the guys who walked out this year as defending champions of their, in, you know, individual events, whatever that event may be, they were all defending champions. And instead of getting that big, you know, welcome into an arena where they won the previous year, walking out to a packed house, centre stage, live to the world, they had to walk out in front of me and two cameramen and somebody else. You know, it's not, it's not really what we signed up for. But I think, you know you really have to drop that mentality as quickly as you can. It's been a real stern year, a stern, steep learning curve for everyone. Um, and, you know, you can see the guys that have coped with it the best. They're the ones with the trophies at the end of the day. The game hasn't changed. The, game, the rules of the game are the same. The pockets haven't moved. Um, the tables are the same. The rules of the game haven't changed. It's really been a mental challenge this year. Uh, and those that, have, those that have coped with that mental challenge they've the ones that have been successful. You will get out of uh, Milton Keynes shortly, of course, because the big the big show is in Sheffield. Are you looking forward to that? Yeah, well, I will just say, I don't think I'll be getting a job as the, on the Milton Keynes tourist board anytime soon. <laughs> <No. laughs> uh, they're, not, they're not ringing me off the hook. <laughs> I don't think you're going to be too worried about that. <laughs> they're, not, they're not ringing me about that. But um, no, I, I, I mean, when they said that the World Championships would be back in Sheffield, um, and then there's talk of having a crowd there at the Crucible. Um, you know, I was obviously overjoyed at that. And there was a podcast early, out earlier this week where Barry talked about the potential of, of trying to get as you know, full a crowd as he possibly can. Um, and again, you know, that's something that I'm very keen on. And I know, you know, that all the, all the other players share that. I really hope for somebody like Aaron or other, you know, first time pros out there, it'd be great for one of them or some of them to make it through the qualifiers of the Worlds and get to the Crucible and, and get to feel what it's like to walk out there in front of a crowd. Because there was a few lads last year, I think Elliot Slesser qualified last year, made his debut there and walked out in front of nobody. Fresh cake. Yeah. And that's soul destroying. Um, I'm good friends with Mark Allen, as most people know, and we played a match in the Tour Champs last year. We were one of the first matches uh, last year to play in front of nobody. Of course, I said at the time, Mark Allen's used to playing in front of nobody anyway. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's not easy. Um, you know, you chase, this, you chase this dream of being a professional touring sportsman, playing to packed houses. You grow up watching those videos of Jimmy White and Alex Siggins and Ken and all those other players in front of packed crowds 
and then you get your go and you walk out in front of nobody. It, it's quite difficult. You see the young players coming through in Europe too. It's nice to see the likes of Brian Ochoski from France and Ben Mertens from uh, Belgium. Uh, yeah. You know, and, some, and one or two Austrian players coming through. It's certainly through the EBSA has been significantly, you know, successful over the years with the European Championships. Uh, but yes. now those young players that have played in those EBSA events are getting invites to world qualifiers and that's got to be great for the game. Listen, it's great to, to spread the word and um, these, these guys get invited in and that's right. You know, it's got, I thought it was really positive news, the announcement World Snooker made about the two cards for the ladies game. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, all for it as many, you know, let's bring as many people into this game as we possibly can. The opportunities for all. The only, the only obstacle to for it should be ability. Um, it shouldn't be where you're from or what country you were lucky enough that your parents, you know, met and married in. That shouldn't have any bearing on it. Um, what sex you are or any of those things. It should be purely based on how good you are at putting those balls in the pockets. And as you say, to see the likes of Choiski and Mertens coming through, along with Aaron Hill and a few others, um, I think it's really, really good. There's a lad from Aust uh, Poland, I think, called Antek Polowski, yes. who's on his way through. He's been supported for many years through the Paul Hunter Foundation, uh, and he's on his way. Uh, and, um, you know, it's great to see. It was, he was reported to have spoken uh, about his uh, adventure, his game with Ronnie O'Sullivan, um, uh, the young Polish, or the young Russian lad. Uh, really enjoyed it. He's there again. I mean, those kind of experiences, you can't buy them, can you? We lost him, have we? I think we've lost Sean. Oh, he's back. He's back. I don't know if you heard that. If you heard that. Hey, guys. You're back. You're back. You're back. <laughs> you made a mention of the Russian player. He's a very good player, too. He had a great experience of playing against Ronnie, I think. Uh, it was reported uh, recently. I read something about that. And he learned from that. He said he learned more from that experience than he did from any other competition. And obviously, mm. you know, here in Ireland, when Aaron beat uh, Ronnie O'Sullivan, we all learned a few things as well. So, you know, there is, and I think the question was made earlier, uh, Angus made a great point about the standard. Uh, because the top 64 is not an easy place to stay in at the moment because there's a very little between maybe number 16 and 64 in terms of how players can move with the, you know, with such close uh, standards of play. I can tell you there's very little between anyone on the tour from number one to one to eight. There's very little difference. Uh, and generally the only difference is that the ones that are used to doing it in front of a crowd, when it matters, they're the ones who are closer to the top of the rankings. That's really the only difference that I can see. And of course, this year, uh, with there being no crowds, it's been a much more level playing field. Um, and I, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've fallen foul of it myself this year. There have been matches I've lost to players this year who have played above and beyond their normal standard because they're not because there's no crowd there, and it's like playing a practice game for them. But what that shows is that everyone on the tour is capable of, on their day. Is capable of beating everyone else, and um, that's exactly how it should be. But as I say, I, you know, the flip side of that is when crowds, when normality does break out uh, and crowds do come back, it'll be interesting to see how these lads do then. I've got a feeling that somebody like Aaron, who I've got to know a little bit over the last year or so, I have a feeling he'll do very well in front of a, a big crowd. I think he's that type of lad, I don't think he'll shy away from it at all. Whereas I think some of the others, they might walk out and be a bit like a rabbit in the headlights, you know. Uh, and that's the difference. You know, you see somebody going back to the story I said earlier about when I was a child and I went to play at the Brentwood Centre against O'Sullivan as a 10 or an 11 year old boy. You know, O'Sullivan was the, the epitome of it. 17 burst onto the scene, won the UK championships and just smacked everyone around. Wasn't phased by it at all. Um, now, of course, somebody like O'Sullivan, you know, has had many, many that things happened to him in his life, lots of good things, some bad things. He's had lots of advantages financially, you know, on and off the table, never wanted for anything, of course. But what he did have in spades was that ability to go out there and play like it meant nothing when it meant everything. And it didn't matter to him whether there was one person there or, or 10,000 people sat there. He played exactly the same. And for any young people here tonight, anyone watching this in the future, you know, that really is the secret. If you can go out there and, you know, they talk about taking your practice game to the match table. If you can go out there and play as if it means nothing, when it means everything, 
you're going to have half a chance. You recently stood down as the player's representative and our own Ken Doherty has taken the reins now. Um, how do you think that's going to pan out? I mean, Ken, you know, is pretty clued in, we must all admit, you know, he's a fantastic ambassador for the game in Ireland, former world champion, uh, first Republic of Ireland, uh, or new Republic of Ireland uh, world champion. You know, I think that it's probably a very good fit, is it, for the players? Yeah, they'd be very, very hard pushed to find a better representative uh, for them, I have to say. Uh, and he's been, you know, he's been a board member of WPBSA for many, many years, working in the background, really, you know, involved in a lot of key decisions, which, you know, perhaps a lot of the players on tour might not see. But, you know, a lot of players around the world through their national governing bodies and the support that WPBSA gives them under the canopy of uh, um, the WSF now, um, those decisions are there and they've borne fruit over the years. And Ken's been a significant player in those decisions uh, and really, um, you know, was, was the right man for the job. Uh, and it's great now to see World Snooker Tour and WPBSA reforming, um, coming together in a slightly different way uh, so that we now have WPBSA and all of the play people that they look after, the, the ladies and the, um, uh, the disability games and, and, and the rules and regs of the games. And we now have WPBSA players, which Ken heads up. And really their job is to represent the tour's needs to Barry. Yeah. And it's great to have that voice. That's brilliant. We've got um, Angus, I think he wants to come back with a question, I believe. Yes, if I may, sorry, um, with the standard of safety play that now exists and the ability to lay and get out of snookers, I'm always surprised that more pros don't play on when they need one, two snookers, maybe on the colours or even the last, you know, two or three reds or whatever. Because uh, certainly I used to never give up until the pink was gone virtually. However, I do think it's been crazy watching Ronnie, you know, needing 15 snookers on the blue and playing on. But where's mm. the line that, Sean, do you think? It, it, it's impossible to, to, to rule for it, I believe. But I, I, I'm surprised that uh, you see so many players give up when they need maybe two snookers. And yet I think it's crazy to still play on when you need 15. Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, somebody like O'Sullivan, I think he likes to play the fool quite a lot. But I can assure you, he isn't. And um, he, he will have read the rules. He, he, he understands the rules. He knows exactly where that line is. And he does, he does get a bit of a kick out of um, being able to, you know, wind everyone up mm. and have a bit of fun with everyone. And he knows that they can't stop him from playing on for snookers when there's anything else, you know, more than the pink on the table. He knows they can't do anything about it and uh, quite enjoys winding everybody up. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, he, he said that he was using it as practice. Of course, of course he was doing it at events where Eurosport are in, are, are in town. He has his own table installed in the Eurosport studio. Everybody thinks that's there for them to do demos on. It's only there for him to practice on. Uh, and, they, and they do demos around that. It's actually the other way around. Um, so that wasn't quite true. Um, so I think, I think he himself, I think he likes to just mess people around. I think he likes having the crack with people and seeing seeing how far he can push them. I think he likes pushing the authorities. He is a little bit that way inclined. Um, I don't think that would be unfair to say that. Um, but I, I, I would be with you. I, I'm surprised it's become a bit of a trend now that if it's more than a couple of snookers, people don't tend to bother. Um, and with these slippy cloths and the cushions and the balls now being lighter and slippier than ever, getting out of the snooker is more precarious than it's ever been. So, I mean, I myself will carry on probably up to sort of four, yeah. uh, something like that. But I, I, I also would make the point that I think more than ever, I think a lot of players, either through direct communication with World Snooker or maybe reading too much social media, are more aware than ever of potentially the potential damaging effects of games taking too long, people on social media don't tend to like watching people chase for too many snookers. And so I think they play with that weight on them in, in, a, in a way that the players of the 80s and 90s and early 2000s didn't have that pressure. They didn't have social media pressure. Um, I think Stephen Hendry's always quick to forget that uh, when he's quite critical in commentary of modern day players. Um, 
he didn't have any of that to deal with when he was at the peak of the game. He, he, he didn't have a mobile phone. He didn't have Twitter, Instagram or anyone calling him all the names under the sun yeah. other, than his, other than his manager. Uh, he didn't have to deal with it at all from anyone. So the world's a different place and we're all, I'm very aware of people on social media who criticise me and for my shot selections. Um, that's usually my wife. Uh, <laughs> but I'm very aware of it. You know, I'm aware of that feedback. And so I think a lot of players, they stop the game quickly to avoid, as mad as it sounds, I think a lot of players throw the towel in early now to court favour with the fans rather than playing on uh, in the sort of older spirit. You know, you can imagine Thorburn, he'd have stood there all night. You'd have had to scrape him off the table. Of course, that, that doesn't bring the fans pouring through the door. So, and my fa- my final question to Sean is, how many of Mark J. Williams' hashtags can you read or understand? <laughs> uh, that would be a big fat zero. <laughs> None. I don't think he can even understand them. No idea what he's talking about. I don't speak Welsh. Uh, and it doesn't look like he does either. <laughs> can I, Shane Cor, I think, wants to ask a question as well. Shane? Hi, Sean. Uh, I mentioned Selbridge a few times. Yeah, um, hi, Shane. Hi. Not too bad, Sean. Uh, are you getting the same quality practice uh, whilst living in Ireland than you would have had living in the UK? Are, are you getting the same quality match practice in the build-up to tournaments? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there's obviously a, a, a smaller pool of, of professional players to practice with here than there was in the UK. Um, I was lucky in the UK. I lived, you know, I grew up in the Midlands, which was a hub of snooker, really. London was only an hour away. You know, there were lots of good players within an hour's drive of where I grew up. Um, And, you know, where my family are from there, up in Manchester, you know, where I moved to in later years, you know, there were, again, you know, the North West is an absolute hotbed of snooker into Leeds and all the rest of it. So, you know, there's no question that the pool of players, the choice of players to pick the phone up to and go for a sparring session uh, against in the UK was bigger than it is here in the Republic. But, you know, they're still here uh, and there's still some very, very good players to play. You know, I've picked a lot of balls out for Ken, uh, for Fergal, uh, for Ross, uh, you know, for, for, for Mark up there in the north. You know, there have been lots of players that I've spent a lot of time practicing with. Um, and, uh, you know, as I say, whilst the pool of choice might be smaller here, um, the quality I would say is 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 as good uh, at a minimum um, is at is is as good. So um, you perhaps just have to be a little bit more on your toes here, but you can still get a good game with somebody if you know where to look. Yeah, sure, Sean. I had one other question before I let you go. Do you know what uh, O'Sullivan's announcement is going to be on Tuesday? There's 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 a, a thing up that uh, there's some conference or something he's doing at two o'clock or three o'clock I think it is next Tuesday do you have any rumours what he's about to announce no absolutely not no as news to me I, I, I um, he hasn't sent an invite to me uh, <laughs> so uh, don't yeah. know uh, do I couldn't tell you no I don't know don't know yeah. I'm sorry yeah. no That's problem really thanks Sean cheers Alan I believe you've got one more question uh, thanks very much uh, Dylan um Sean, uh, my coach is uh, PJ Nolan, and uh, PJ would say to me that I should go to tournaments and uh, watch the elite players playing, just to study their play, you know. And mm. uh, I was at one match in the uh, Darcy McGee's, and I was watching a guy called Philip O'Connor, and he was losing the first frame, and then in the fellow was like really confident and all, and then in the next frame, he. Uh, he tied the fella up, you know. He just like went all defensive and uh, stopped the guy from playing uh, attacking snooker, you know. And uh, I really learned from watching that. But uh, my question is, is, have you any advice for me to start learning how to play defensive snooker? How to play what, sorry? More defensive? More defensive snooker, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're, you're probably asking the wrong person. I think I think I've only played ten safety shots in my life. <laughs> uh, it's not something I'm known for, but I think you know I, I, I've I, in all seriousness, you know, it's a big part of the game now because everyone is so attacking. Everyone likes to go for those long pots. They like to get in the balls and break build, and everyone's a lot better at it now 
um, at the pro and amateur and club level. Everyone's much better at that. And so the defensive side of the game has almost become as important, if not more. And you could see that from someone like O'Sullivan when he teamed up with Ray Reardon, uh, John Higgins, Mark Williams, the class of 90s. The reason they're still around yeah. is because their defensive game is better than everyone else's. It's not because their potting's better than everyone else's. It's because they're better at stopping everyone else. When they're, they're coming up against the Jack Lazowskis and the Martin Goulds and the Dingja, they these people are potters. Yeah. And so someone like Higgins, he just sits and waits for you to make your mistake and then he clears up. And uh, that's why they've had such a prolonged career. Now, you know, somebody like Mark Selby, he's set to have a career and basically until he decides to give up because he, his tactical game so strong. Uh He's also, you know, it's, it's also massively boring. It has to be said, like, you know, you get no fun watching it. But there, I mean, there is obviously skill involved. There is, you know, massive amount of skill in keeping you out and tying you up and getting you right sides of the table and behind colours and stuff. There's a lot of skill involved in that. Um, but I remember Terry Griffiths, or Terry Griffiths was renowned as one of the strongest tactical players in the game. He did say at the end of the day, you still have to put the balls in the pockets. Um, and I suppose the journey I've been on in my professional career, when I burst onto the scene, I was very attacking. Then I tried to tone it down and I've gone through peaks and troughs of being more attacking and less attacking. I think at the end of the day, you've got to be true to yourself. And if you try and play like someone else and it, and it isn't natural to you, you just it's just like having a fight with one arm tied behind your back. You know, you've got, to, you've got to try and be yourself and play your own game. Uh, and if you're not a great defensive player, you have to, you know, you accept that you probably lose a few games that you perhaps shouldn't. But you might be a, a better potter and a break builder than someone else. And you might win games that they wouldn't. So at the end of the day, you know, it all evens itself out. Sean, before we bring it to a close there, can I ask you, the draws... Uh... There's been some dubious draws just uh, come up recently or last week between Henry and White. Are they still fixing draws with, uh, you know, what, what, any comment on that? Is it? <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you alleging that that was fixed? <laughs> um, well, I mean, the draw, that, that particular draw couldn't have been, uh, it couldn't have been any better, could it? <laughs> um, no, great, yeah. that couldn't have been any better we, we've been screaming for years when I was on the board representing the players one of the biggest things that came out of our chats with the players was they wanted live draws yeah they wanted to see it and I've no idea why the only draw we get to watch these days is either the shootout draw or the final stages for the world championship They'll, you know, you'll get to see that on YouTube um, I've no real idea why these draws, why they're not all live. Um, would you know? Was that draw fixed? I'm told it wasn't. <laughs> they've, they've told me absolutely categorically it wasn't. But it, it is the draw that you would have picked, isn't it? If you could pick, you would have picked it. Um, and I, in all seriousness, um, you know, this is where the commercial world meets the sporting world. That yeah. match gathered so much interest and so many column inches for the game. It can only be a good thing. Those two, those two honorary tour card players playing each other. That can only be positive for snooker. Um, so if, 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 if they put them together on purpose, maybe it was a good decision. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, just anybody else got a question before we? Uh, I think David Farrelly is. Oh, yeah, just bear with us a second there, Sean, please. No worries. David Far David? Hello, hi. Oh, David Sean, there? Yeah. Hello. Where, Dave? Hi, Dave. Hi, Dave. Hi. Hi, um, hi Sean, I've actually met you before down in Selby, John Fergal's nephew. All right. Okay. Oh, hi, Dave. Yeah, of course you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, my question for you is... Just why turn is it... a couple of more lights off, Dave, then we can't see you at all. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> Christ. Has the power gone out in Selbridge? Where go the fuck out? What is the key thing you need to become a professional nowadays? Yeah, it'd be very hard to be very hard to you know to to put that down on on one thing. We you know go back to I think it was one of the very first questions tonight. You know from PJ about dedication, um, and I would always that would always be my top. You know, there's a a whole list of vital ingredients that you need to become a professional player or a successful player. Um, you know, be that in the amateur status, international or professional, whatever. Um, but dedication would be right up there. Um, I think it's very hard to progress in a sport like snooker if you don't have that innate talent for it. There are certain aspects of the game that I was very fortunate enough as a child. I didn't need anyone to explain how to do that to me. I, I didn't need anyone to explain to me how to sight the ball or how to choose the shape of the ball I wanted to part of. I knew, I just instinctively knew how to do that. Um, but I was very lucky. Um, whereas, you know, if you ask me to throw a dart at treble 20, I, you know, I might hit the board. I might not. Who knows? Uh, that doesn't come naturally to me. So, you know, I think you have to be lucky and find what works for you. But I would say dedication would be right up there. There aren't, there aren't many people uh, in, in sport who have a talent for something, who dedicate themselves completely to it and then don't make it. There aren't many of those out there. And, you know, if you're, if you're unlucky and perhaps you don't have you know, a God-given talent or, you know, the ability to play or whatever it might be, then then that's, you know, unfortunate. And, you know, you need to go and try your hand at something else because snooker will take years or years away from you whilst you're trying to learn it. Um, and I've got friends and family myself who are trying to desperately to walk the path of becoming professional players. Uh, uh, and maybe, you know, maybe maybe one that they might have to accept that it's not for them, but, but they're triers. But you need all of the ingredients and talent is one of them. But I, I would think, you know, dedication, um, dedication is, is right up there. There are, there are players out there on the tour who have won professional ranking events, pr world championships even. They're not the most talented player out there. They're not the most talented player in their country, professional or amateur. But they have dedicated themselves. They have given of themselves in a way that other players weren't prepared to. Uh, there were players that I grew up with, players that, you know, Robbie, who's here tonight, that we both know, some of them no longer with us, who we grew up playing with. They were young children um, uh, uh, and they were absolutely, you know, the most naturally gifted players I've ever seen. They, but they weren't prepared to dedicate themselves to the game in a way that others were. And that's why you've not heard of them. Um, and I named earlier on, you know, you've got your Stephen Maguire's, Ryan Day's, Ali Carter's, um, David Gilbert's, Mark Selby's, people that I grew up playing with, Tom Ford's. These are the players who are now up there at the top of the game, making it as pros. And that's because in, in the main part, they were prepared to do what was asked of them. Uh, they weren't going out on a Friday night with their mates. They were in the snooker club working on the game. And that's generally the difference. We have a couple more questions, and that's it then, lads. Derek, I believe. Derek Jr., can you believe it? <laughs> Derek uh, Riley Jr. Uh, Howard Ames. How are you? Howard Ames. Good, how are you? Good now, good now, thanks. I was just wondering, you see yourself and you have Selby, Robinson, you've lasted for the last 10 years or so up at the top 10 and... Each tournament you see, you know these guys are going to be up there, but you have players coming through now, like you see Aaron Hill beating Ronnie this year, and you have the Asian talent coming through. How do you think that's going to affect the sport over the next 10 or 15 years? I think it's one of the good things about snooker is that the rankings don't tell lies. And currently, the best players in the world are the best players in the world. Um uh, and the, 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 the rankings don't tell fibs. They don't tell porkies. Uh, and in 20 years' time, the rankings will probably look completely different as those players that you mentioned and players we're yet to hear about come through their amateur systems around the world, through their NGBs, uh, and make it to the professional tour. But we don't know who these people are yet. 
But the, one of the great things about snooker is that the only obstacle from a, a rookie to the top of the rankings, the only obstacle they face is themselves. And if they're good enough, they'll climb the ladder and they deserve everything they get. I'd love, nothing would please me more than to see, you know, a Ross Bullman make it on the tour or Aaron Hill to, make, you know, consolidate and go on next year and climb that rankings, climb those ladders and start making a great professional career for himself because the opportunities are there. They've got opportunities now. I didn't have them when I turned pro. Selby didn't have them when he turned pro. The game has expanded now around the world in a way that we could have only dreamt of. And in 10, 20 years' time, it'll be even better, God willing. So good luck to them. And ultimately, if they're good enough, they'll come through. And we'll have the last question to the very man you just mentioned, Ross Bullman. You have a question, hey, Ross? John. Hey, Ross. Good to see you. How's it going? Good, you? Yeah, very good. How are you? Good. Uh, just ask, uh, I suppose, the balance of practice. Like, what, what would you think is on your own then playing games? Is uh, what I want to know, really. Yeah. I, I think this varies from person to person. Um, mm. uh, and it's something that I'm still uh, trying to work out. I prefer practicing on my own. Yeah. But I know that practicing with other players is more beneficial for me. Mm. Yeah. People say that. Fergal said that a lot. I think it's frozen. He kind of said three days. Oh, you're back. Um, back. Yeah, so, yeah. so I think I, I personally prefer practicing on my own. That's That would be my preference. But I yeah. know that for me to get the best out of myself, I have to do a mixture of practicing on my own and practicing with other players such as yourself, you know, Ken, yeah. Fergal, Aaron, going over up to Antrim with Mark and Geordie up there, you know. And that's a little bit more commitment. You know, that's a little bit harder work. I don't necessarily want to do that. But yeah. I know that's what works best for me. And I think that's probably, you know, that's true for all of the players. I think, you know, Mark Selby, I know Mark Selby prefers to practice on his own. Yeah. He goes yeah, into his lockdown, new... really, is the problem, isn't it? It's very, very difficult. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the pros on the tour, they have got this dispensation to travel to other pros and they are allowed to train. If you're not on the tour, mm. you don't have that. And that's very, very hard. And, you know, you just see there last night on the news, it was only the GAA lads were in trouble for being out training. Yeah. You know, they're, yeah. they're not professionals and and, and and you do fall foul of that. So you have to be careful with that. But those times will return. In the absence of it, you know, you just have to do the best you can. Mm. Yeah. And do your, do your drills, work on the shots. You know your own game better than anyone. You know the shots that you're strong on and you know the shots that need work. Yeah. And so... Yeah. Lockdown, I would, if I were you, I would see lockdown as a massive opportunity. Yeah. To yeah. practice those shots that I wasn't very good at. Yeah. I and just set yeah. them up time after time after time and keep grafting. Yeah. I'm working a bit at the moment. So it's just, I'm getting back into now soon. Like, so good. I kind of want to know really. Oh. Good. All right. Then. That's it. Okay. Sean, listen, again, on behalf of uh, SBI. We sincerely like to thank you for your time this evening. Uh, no, you're very welcome. You, it's been a pleasure, you, lads. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank Darcy McGee's too for putting the roof over your head uh, Yeah. this yeah. particular Zoom. And I know yeah. that you're not going to go behind the bar. You're going to go straight out the door and straight home. You won't break the fight yet. We know that. Ta the taxi's already out the door. Fair play. And thanks again to Robbie. I know he's there alongside you. And Mighty is there as well, Shane. Uh, on behalf of SBI, our chairman, Dylan will say the last few words, but on behalf of all of us, I think it's the start of something very important for the amateur game in Ireland that we have some sort of link with professional players. And there is some sort, as I said at the start, that I know that you're a big fan of that yourself, that there has to be a link between the two. So on absolutely, behalf yeah. of us, we're absolutely thrilled that you could make it with us this evening. And we'd deeply like to say thanks very much for your time. And Dylan? Yes, thank you, Sean. It's been a pleasure. More players that are here today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again at some of the events we've got down the line yeah. with our academy, hopefully the new academy will see you soon. Be so my pleasure, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Sean. Thank you very much, Thank you. Sean. Very Thanks.